The Lotus Sutra, Chapter 15, Bodhisattvas Emerging from the Earth At that time, the Bodhisattva Mahasattvas who had arrived from other lands and whose numbers exceeded that of the sands of eight Ganges rivers, stood up in the great assembly, bowed with their palms pressed together, and then spoke to the Buddha, saying, quote, O Bhagavat, if you give us permission to diligently strive to preserve, recite, copy, and pay homage to this Lotus Sutra after the Parinirvana of the Buddha in this Saha world, then we will extensively teach it in this land. Then the Buddha addressed the assembly of Bodhisattva Mahasattva, saying, Enough, O sons of a virtuous family, there is no need for you to preserve this sutra. Why is this? In my Saha world there are Bodhisattva Mahasattvas equal to the sands of 60,000 Ganges rivers in number, and each of these Bodhisattvas, in turn, has a retinue equal to the sands of 60,000 Ganges rivers. After my Parinirvana, they can preserve, recite, and extensively teach this sutra. When the Buddha said this, all the lands of the great manifold cosmos in the Saha world quaked and the earth split. From out of this crevice, there simultaneously appeared incalculable thousands of myriads of kotis of bodhisattva mahasattvas. All of these bodhisattvas had golden bodies endowed with the 32 marks and radiating immeasurable rays of light. They had all previously been living in the space under the earth of the Saha world. Having heard the sound of Sakyamuni's teaching, all of these bodhisattvas emerged from below. Each of those bodhisattvas presided over a great assembly, and each led a retinue equal to the sands of 60,000 Ganges rivers in number. How much more numerous were the bodhisattvas who emerged leading retinues equal in number to the sands of 50,000, 40,000, 30,000, 20,000, or 10,000 Ganges rivers. How much more numerous were the bodhisattvas who emerged, leading retinues even equal to the sands of one Ganges river, half a Ganges river, a quarter of a Ganges river, or even just one thousandth of a myriad of a koti of a noyota of the sands of a Ganges river? How many more retinues were there numbering thousands of myriads of kotis of Neutas? How many more retinues were there numbering myriads of kotis? How many more were there numbering ten million, one million, or even ten thousand? How many more were there numbering one thousand, one hundred, or even ten? How much more numerous were bodhisattvas leading disciples numbering five, four, three, two, or even one. And how many more bodhisattvas were there who had eagerly practiced alone and far from the worldly life? The number of such bodhisattvas as these is incalculable and limitless, beyond all calculation and metaphor. Having emerged from the earth, each of these bodhisattvas approached the Tathagatas, Prabhutaratna, and Sakyamuni, still seated in the beautiful seven-jeweled stupa in the air. Going up to them, they bowed until their foreheads touched the feet of both Bhagavats. Then, having bowed to the other Buddhas, each sitting on a lion's seat under the jewel trees, they circumambulated them to the right three times, honoring them, with their palms pressed together. Having praised them with various bodhisattva eulogies, they withdrew to one side and joyfully gazed at the two Bhagavats. All these bodhisattva mahasattvas, having emerged from the earth, praised the Buddhas with various bodhisattva eulogies. While they did, fifty intermediate kalpas passed. During this time, the Buddha Sakyamuni sat in silence, and the fourfold assemblies were also silent while the fifty intermediate kalpas passed. Because of the Buddha's transcendent powers, 
the great assemblies believed that the time that had passed was only half a day. Then, through the transcendent powers of the Buddha, the fourfold assemblies also saw the bodhisattvas filling the air throughout the immeasurable hundreds of thousands of myriads of kotis of lands. There were four leaders among these bodhisattvas gathered there. They were called Visistakarita, Anantakarita, Visudakarita, and Supra Tisthita Karitra. These four bodhisattvas were the foremost leaders in the assembly. At the head of the great assembly, they each pressed their palms together, gazed at Sakyamuni Buddha, and inquired of him, saying, O Bhagavat, are you without illness or pain? Are you at ease in practice or not? Do those who should be saved accept your teaching easily or not? Do they not make you weary, O Bhagavat? Thereupon, the four great bodhisattvas spoke these verses, quote, O Bhagavat, are you at ease? Are you without illness or pain? Are you fatigued with leading and inspiring sentient beings? Do the sentient beings accept your guidance easily or not? Do they not tire the Bhagavat? At that time, the Bhagavat spoke to the great assembly of Bodhisattvas, saying, quote, It is exactly like this, O sons of a virtuous family. It is exactly so. The Tathagata is at ease and without illness or pain. It is easy to save sentient beings, and I am not fatigued. Why is this? Because sentient beings have continually received my guidance throughout many lives, and they have also planted roots of good merit by revering and honoring the Buddhas of the past. When these sentient beings first saw me and heard my teaching, all, except for those who had previously practiced and studied the inferior vehicle, immediately believed and accepted it, and entered the Tathagata's wisdom. Now I enable even such people as these to listen to this sutra and enter the Buddha's wisdom. Then the great Bodhisattva spoke these verses, quote, Splendid, splendid, O Bhagavat, great hero, all the sentient beings can easily be brought to the path. They can ask about the profound wisdom of the Buddhas. Hearing about it, they trust and accept it. We rejoice about this. At that time, the Bhagavat praised the foremost of the great Bodhisattvas, saying, quote, Splendid, splendid! O sons of virtuous families, thoughts of joy regarding the Tathagata have awakened in you. Then, the Bodhisattva Maitreya and the assembly of Bodhisattvas equal in number to the sands of 8,000 Ganges rivers, thought this, quote, Looking far into the past, we have never seen or heard of such an assembly of great Bodhisattva Mahasattvas who have now emerged from the earth and are standing before the Bhagavat with their palms pressed together in reverence, asking the Tathagata questions. Then, Bodhisattva Mahasattva Maitreya, knowing the minds of the Bodhisattvas, whose number was equal to the sands of 8,000 Ganges rivers, and wanting to clear up their confusion, faced the Buddha, with the palms of his hands pressed together, and addressed him in verse, saying, quote, We have never seen such a great assembly of incalculable thousands of myriads of kotis of bodhisattvas before. We entreat you, O best of humans, to explain it to us. Where have they come from? For what reason have they gathered here? They look magnificent and have great transcendent powers, their wisdom is beyond our comprehension. They are firm in their resolve, have the power of great perseverance, and an appearance that sentient beings desire to see. Where have they come from? Each of these bodhisattvas is leading a retinue whose number is incalculable, like the sands of the Ganges River. Some great bodhisattvas are leading retinues equal in number to the sands of 60,000 Ganges rivers. Great are the assemblies, single-mindedly seeking the Buddha path. These great leaders, 
equal in number to the sands of 60,000 Ganges rivers, have come all together to pay homage to the Buddha and preserve this sutra. The number of bodhisattvas leading retinues equal in number to the sands of 50,000 Ganges rivers is even greater. And the number of bodhisattvas who lead retinues equal in number to the sands of 40,000, 30,000, 20,000, 10,000, 1,000, 100, even one, one half, one third, one fourth, one myriadth of a koti of the sands of a Ganges river exceeds even these. There are disciples who number thousands of myriads of nayutas, myriads of kotis, or even half a koti. Their numbers also exceed that mentioned above. There are also disciples in retinues of one million, ten thousand, one thousand, one hundred, fifty, ten, even three, two, or one in number. There are also great bodhisattvas who have come without retinues, desiring to be in solitude. The number of those who have come before the Buddha is far beyond any calculation. If anyone counted the number of such a great assembly with bamboo counting sticks, he would not finish even after exhausting kalpas greater in number than the sands of the Ganges River. Who has taught the Dharma to this assembly of bodhisattvas, endowed with great dignity and perseverance? Who has inspired and perfected them? Under whom did the thought of enlightenment first awaken in them? Which Buddha Dharma did they praise? Whose sutra have they preserved and practiced? And which Buddha path have they followed? Such bodhisattvas as these, endowed with transcendent powers and the power of great wisdom, have all emerged out of the earth, which quaked in the four directions and split asunder. O oh, Bhagavat, we have never seen such a thing before. We entreat you to tell us the name of the land from where they have come. We have been constantly traveling in various regions. Nevertheless, we have never seen such a thing before. We do not know even a single person in this assembly. All of a sudden, they have emerged from the earth. We entreat you to explain the reason why. All of the immeasurable hundreds of thousands of kotis of bodhisattvas in this great assembly now wish to know about this matter. There must be underlying causes for this to explain all of these bodhisattvas. O Bhagavat, he of immeasurable qualities, we entreat you to clear up the confusion of the assembly. Thereupon the Buddhas, who were the magically created forms of Sakyamuni Buddha, arrived from other incalculable thousands of myriads of kotis of lands, and sat cross-legged on lion seats under the jewel trees in the eight directions. Each attendant of these Buddhas had seen the great assembly of bodhisattvas as they emerged from out of the earth and floated in midair in the four directions of the great manifold cosmos. Each of them addressed his Buddha, saying, O Bhagavad, where has this great assembly of immeasurable, limitless, incalculable bodhisattvas come from? Then the Buddhas answered their attendants, saying, O sons of a virtuous family, wait a moment. There is a bodhisattva mahasattva called Maitreya, who has received a prediction from the Buddha Sakyamuni that he will become a Buddha after Sakyamuni in the future. Since he has already asked about this, the Buddha will now answer him. You shall be able to hear the reason yourselves. Then the Buddha Sakyamuni addressed Bodhisattva Maitreya, saying, Splendid, splendid, O Ajita! You have asked the Buddha an important question. You should all single-mindedly don the armor of perseverance and be of firm will. The Tathagata now wants to reveal the wisdom of the Buddhas the inherent transcendent powers of the Buddhas, the lion-like dignified power of the Buddhas, the majestic and mighty power of the Buddhas. Thereupon, the Bhagavad, wanting to elaborate on the meaning of this further, spoke these verses, quote, 
you should be persistent and wholeheartedly attentive, for I want to explain it to you. Do not have any doubts, for the wisdom of the Buddha is difficult to comprehend. You should now awaken to the power of faith, and with perseverance abide in the good. Now you will all be able to hear what you have never heard before. I will now put you at ease. Have no doubts or fear. The Buddha never speaks false words. His wisdom is immeasurable. The foremost dharma that he has attained is profound and difficult to explain. I will now expound this difficult teaching, so you should listen wholeheartedly. Then the Bhagavat, after speaking these verses, addressed Bodhisattva Maitreya, saying, quote, I will now proclaim it to all of you in this assembly. O Ajita, all of you have never seen these immeasurable, innumerable, incalculable great Bodhisattva Mahasattvas who have emerged from out of the earth. Having attained highest complete enlightenment in this Saha world, I led, inspired, and instructed these bodhisattvas, restrained their thoughts, and caused the thought of the path to awaken in them. When these bodhisattvas lived in the space under the earth of this Saha world, they recited various sutras, became well versed in them, and contemplated, analyzed, and correctly remembered them. O Ajita, all these sons of a virtuous family did not wish to be among the multitude where there is always much discussion. They always wanted to be in quiet places. They diligently strove without resting or relying upon divas or humans. They always desired the profound wisdom without obstructions. They always wanted the Dharma of the Buddhas. They strove wholeheartedly in seeking the highest wisdom. At that time, the Bhagavad, wanting to elaborate on the meaning of this further, spoke these verses, quote, O Ajita, you should know that all of these great bodhisattvas have practiced the wisdom of the Buddha for innumerable kalpas. They have all been inspired by me, and the thought of the great path has awakened in them. They are my heirs. Abiding in this world, they always cultivated ascetic practices, wishing to be in quiet places. Rejecting the clamor of the multitude, they did not want to have much discussion. All my heirs, such as these, constantly practicing my teaching with vigor day and night. In order to seek the Buddha path, they lived in the space under the earth of this Saha world. They were firm in recollection, and they always diligently sought wisdom. Explaining various subtle teachings, their minds were free from fear. Sitting under the Bodhi tree in the city of Gaia, I attained the highest complete enlightenment and turned the wheel of the highest Dharma. I then led and inspired them so that the thought of the path awakened in them for the first time. All of them are now at the stage of non-retrogression and will certainly become Buddhas with no residue. I now teach the truth. You should wholeheartedly believe that from long, long ago I have been leading and inspiring all these bodhisattvas. Then, Bodhisattva Maitreya and the innumerable other Bodhisattvas became doubtful and confused concerning this unprecedented experience. They thought this, quote, How is it possible, in such a short time, for the Bhagavat to have inspired such an immeasurable, limitless, incalculable number of great Bodhisattvas, enabling them to abide in highest complete enlightenment? Immediately, they addressed the Buddha, saying, quote, O Bhagavat, when the Tathagata was a prince, he left the palace of the Sakyas, sat on the terrace of enlightenment, which is not far from the city of Gaia, 
and attained highest complete enlightenment. Since then, more than forty years have passed. How is it possible, O Bhagavat, for you to have done such great Buddha acts in such a short period of time? Is it through the might of the Buddha and through the Buddha's qualities that you have inspired such an assembly of incalculable great bodhisattvas to achieve highest complete enlightenment? O Bhagavat, even if someone counted the number of the great bodhisattvas for thousands of myriads of kotis of kalpas, they would not be able to finish. There would be no end. From long ago, these bodhisattvas have been planning roots of good merit in the presence of immeasurable limitless Buddhas. They have perfected the bodhisattva path and have always practiced the pure path of discipline and integrity. It is, O oh Bhagavat, difficult to believe such things in this world. Suppose a handsome man with dark hair, 25 years of age, were to point to a hundred-year-old man and say, quote, He is my son. And the one-hundred-year-old man points to the young fellow and says, quote, He is my father, and he raised me. This would be difficult to believe. And what the Buddha has now taught is exactly like this. It has not, in fact, been so long since the Buddha attained the path. Yet for the sake of the Buddha path, this great assembly of bodhisattvas has been diligently striving for innumerable thousands of myriads of kotis of kalpas. They have skillfully entered, abided in, and emerged from immeasurable thousands of myriads of kotis of samadhis. They have attained great transcendent powers and practiced the pure path of discipline and integrity for a long time. They have gradually and ably practiced wholesome teachings and are skilled at discussions. They are jewels among humans and a great rarity in the entire world. Today, the Bhagavat has correctly said that after he attained the path of the Buddha, he caused the thought of enlightenment to awaken in the bodhisattvas for the first time. He then led, inspired, and instructed them to approach highest complete enlightenment. O oh, Bhagavat, although it has not been so long since you attained Buddhahood, yet you have really done these great meritorious acts. We believe the Buddha's words, spoken according to our capacities, and that what he says is never false. We are all well versed in the Buddha's knowledge. However, if the bodhisattvas in whom the thought of enlightenment has recently awakened hear this after the Buddha's parinirvana, they will not accept it. And this will bring about conditions for erring deeds that destroy the Dharma. That is why, O Bhagavat, we entreat you to explain it to us and remove our doubts. Moreover, in the future, when the sons of a virtuous family hear this, they will also be free from doubt. Thereupon, Bodhisattva Maitreya, wanting to elaborate upon the meaning of this further, spoke these verses. Long ago, the Buddha left the household of the Sakya clan and approached Gaya, where he sat under the Bodhi tree. It has not been so long since that time. The number of the Buddha's heirs is incalculable. From long ago, they have practiced the Buddha path and attained transcendent powers and the power of wisdom. They have thoroughly studied the Bodhisattva path and are as undefiled by worldly affairs as the lotus blossom in the water. They have emerged from out of the earth, and all stood respectfully before the Bhagavats. It is difficult to comprehend this matter. How can we possibly believe it? The Buddha attained the path only a short time ago, yet he has accomplished so much. We entreat you to remove our doubts and give a detailed explanation according to the truth. Suppose there were a young man just 25 years of age who pointed to a 100-year-old man who was wrinkled and had white hair, saying, This is my offspring. The old man also says, This is my father. The father is young, and the son is old. No one in the world would believe it. The Bhagavat's teaching 
is exactly like this. He attained the path only a very short time ago, yet these bodhisattvas are firm in resolution and without weak will. They have been practicing the bodhisattva path for immeasurable kalpas. They are skilled at difficult discussions, and their minds are free from fear. They are resolute and persevering. They are handsome and dignified, praised by the Buddhas in the Ten Directions. They are good at detailed explanations. They did not want to be among the multitudes, for they always liked being in meditation, and so they lived in the space under the earth in order to seek the Buddha path. Since we heard about this from the Buddha, we have no doubts about it. But we still entreat you, O Buddha, to expound it and make it clear for the future. Anyone in whom doubts awaken and who does not believe in this sutra will certainly fall into the troubled states of being. That is why we now entreat you to explain how, in such a short time, you have led and inspired these innumerable bodhisattvas so that the thought of enlightenment has awakened in them and they abide in the stage of non-retrogression. <laughs> 